Good afternoon. I'm Barbara Wall from the Office of Mission and Ministry. I'm delighted you're all here. Uh, this is the 10th annual conference on Catholic social teaching. The particular topic this time is Catholic social teaching and world poverty. Over the years, we've tried to read the signs of the times, if you will, and create uh, an opportunity on campus, as well as inviting people from across the nation to attend to some of the concerns and issues that affect our world today and the ways in which Catholic social teaching can inform the contemporary dialogue of issues that we're all dealing with in the world. We uh, have also published these talks uh, in a volume called The Journal of Catholic Social Thought. We're delighted um, at this point to uh, to indicate that our speaker today, who is the current president of the Pontifical Office for Justice and Peace, will be the third uh, person in that office that has been published in the Journal of Catholic Social Thought. Some of you here, I think, uh, were here several years ago for Dermot Martin, who um, had that position now as Archbishop uh, of Ireland, uh, of Dublin. So, um, what I'd like to do right now is to uh, take the opportunity to uh, welcome you all in the name of our president, Father Peter Donahue, who was here last night, could not be here today. Uh, he's uh, out of uh, the city, actually out of the state. And uh, he warmly welcomes all of you, and especially uh, uh, His Eminence, Peter Cardinal Turkson. Let me tell you a little bit about um, Cardinal Turkson, if you will. I know he's a very uh, uh, unassuming and humble man, but we need to let you know exactly who he is. Uh, during a special synod dedicated to peace and justice in Africa, Pope Benedict XVI named African Cardinal Peter Turkson as head of the Vatican's Justice and Peace Council. Cardinal Turkson, Ghana's first cardinal enjoyed a high profile during October 4 through 25, Second Special Synod of Bishops for Africa. He spoke out on the need for the Catholic notion of justice in Africa and the world. When Christians think like God does, they begin to forgive one another and recognize each other as brothers and sisters, no matter what their nationality or ethnicity, he said. Cardinal Turkson gained brief global attention at the 1994 Synod of Bishops for Africa, where he said the church should pay more attention to the signs and wonders of the faith and not limit its teaching to books and catechisms. He encouraged a rediscovery of the Christian ministry of healing. Pope John Paul II showed his admiration for Cardinal Turkson by making the 55-year-old Archbishop a cardinal in the 2003 consistory. Cardinal Turkson has been active in interreligious dialogue in Ghana and said in a 2007 interview that Catholics there were being taught the Quran, a sacred book of Islam, and Islamic scriptures to further dialogue and community cohesion. He said the church has adopted a dialogue of action in which Muslims and Catholics come together to cooperate on concrete projects such as drilling wells and building schools. During the Synod of Bishops on the Eucharist in 2005, the Cardinal stressed the need to incorporate dignified African styles of worship during Mass that could include ululation, a joyful or mournful high-pitched cry, or tam-tam drums. If I may, uh, 15 years ago, 15 students and I did go to Ghana, Africa as part of an international Habitat for Humanity experience. We were there 17 days and it was an extraordinary experience on Sunday night when the Catholic community in Bremen for Swansea came out to get us at the Habitat compound with lanterns swinging and singing all the way. And as they brought us to the church for Sunday night celebration, lantern swinging and singing all the way. And the dancing in the church, uh, one student said to me, you know, if we did this in our churches at home, I would go every day. <laughs> the, 
The challenge of the church, he said, is to find a way to make an impact in the secular world, on the political level, in terms of good government and political conflicts that degenerate into tribal conflict. In Ghana, Cardinal Turkson led the effort to establish the country's first Catholic university where he has served as chancellor. Born October 11th on a Monday, in Ghana, your name is attributed to the day of the week that you were born. Okay. He was born in Western Ghana. He studied at St. Teresa's Minor Seminary in Amasano and Pidu before attending St. Anthony on the Hudson Seminary in Rensselaer, New York, where he earned a bachelor's degree in theology. He was ordained a priest in 1975 and from 1976 to 1980 studied in Rome, earning a licentiate in sacred scriptures at the Pontifical Biblical Institute. From 1987 to 1992, he studied for his doctorate at the same institute. In addition to English and the local Fante language, he speaks French, Italian, German, and Hebrew fluently. He has written uh, knowledgeably of Latin and Greek. In addition to English, uh, excuse me, Carlo Turkson has served as a member of the Vatican's Justice and Peace Council since 2008. He is also a member of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Sacraments, the Permanent Council of the Synod of Bishops, and the Supreme Committee of the Pontifical Missionary Societies. He was president of the Ghanaian Bishops Conference and has served as president of the Association of English-Speaking Bishops conference in West Africa. He has served on an international Catholic Methodist Dialogue Commission and was treasurer of the Symposium of Episcopal Conferences of Africa and Madagascar, the continental body of bishops' conferences in Africa. Needless to say, Cardinal Turkson is, uh, is one of our significant leaders in the Catholic Church. We are humbled and delighted to have him here. He traveled from Hong Kong uh, yesterday uh, to be here with us. So I think it's a special treat for us as a university, a, a definite honor and privilege. And I'm delighted that all of you are here uh, to participate in this great event. Please join with me in this a warm Villanova welcome for uh, His Eminence, Peter Cardinal Turkson. Thank you. Uh, now I know what a Villanova welcome looks like, and <laughs> I'll probably take that with me to the Vatican, to the dicastery I work in, and teach them how to do Villanova welcome. <laughs> I am certainly glad to be here this afternoon in your midst and with you, and uh, I'm glad also to share in the thoughts and the thinking that has been going on these past few days here in this university on the church's social doctrine. I only wish to uh, say that naturally and clearly I'll be speaking with a certain bit, a little bit of accent. Uh, Ghana, Ghana was an English colony and got independent only in 1957. So from school, everything is done in English. But as you also know very well, wherever the English language is gotten, it's always taking some local character. So Australian English is not quite the same as American English, and not quite the same as British English. So when it got to West Africa, it was also inculturated and became kind of West African English. So if I speak with an accent which is not quite American or British or Australian, you know where it's coming from. Just that this I would not be pigeon English because that would be an awesome. So <clears throat> I bring you all greetings from the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. And I bring you prayerful wishes for the success of this conference already begun and almost you know, uh, 
coming to a close. My hope this afternoon is to be able to address these two topics, the Church's Social Doctrine and Poverty, at their meeting point, which is in the minds and the hearts of each one of us gathered here, as Catholics, as Christians, as friends, as professors and students, and even as citizens of the United States and indeed citizens of the world. In the spirit of Caritas and Veritate, the last encyclical, social encyclical that we have of Benedict XVI, but the Pope had said that the roadmap for reaching integral human development begins with the Catholic social teaching. Because this social teaching addresses three things. It helps us overcome persistent poverty, and with Christian ministry, applies the church's social teaching to all situations of life with view to promoting integral human development. And integral human development in the words of the Holy Father is to do more, know more, and have more in order to be more. So briefly, following the lead and the suggestion of the topic assigned, the gospel and social teaching of the church on human development, poverty, and Christian ministry, I'd like to quickly take you through the church's social doctrine. It will be a kind of a race, because to do the social doctrine within whatever, but I'll still point out uh, the highlights of all of these uh, doctrines which make up the social doctrine of the church, and at the end of it, make an observation which I think will be very, very important and crucial. Uh, I'm not sure whether our last speaker is still here. But, uh, the, 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 okay, okay. At, at a certain point, there was a thing about the church's magisterium, the social doctrine, and whatever. The point that I'll try to make at the end of uh, this you know, survey of the church's social doctrine would be to say that the social doctrine is not yet been completed. The last, the full stop in the writing of the church's social doctrine is not yet been put. The church's social doctrine is still in the process of writing. Rerum Novarum, the first encyclical, began it, but it's not yet come to a completion. And every, like even your organization of this seminar here, is a contribution to the development of the church's social doctrine. So we're now looking at a set of uh, data prepared and pronounced somewhere which is applied to situation. Yes, there is a little bit of that, but each so the Church's social doctrine being the Christian's way and Christian's own encounter with the social order and the world, inspired by their own faith and the charity of Christ, is an ongoing process. It's an ongoing, some began it before us, so that enabled us to formulate some principles. But it's not yet come to a close because it's still uh, being developed or is still developing in view of the changing uh, a face of our society and in view of the regular encounter between Christians and the, and the world and social uh, situation. So the gospel and the church's heritage of the social teaching. The concern of the social well-being of mankind or humankind is not new to the church. And reflection on what it means to be authentically human in history and culture goes back to the scriptures, to and to the fathers of the church. Thus, beside the reminders about social justice and concern for the poor, which we read about in the prophets of the Old Testament, you will also find out that the Sabbath institutions in the Old Testament already sought not only to regulate worship of God, but to regulate also the social order and concern for the poor. The Sabbath institutions is this. Uh, probably, it's something you know, but I'll probably refer to it as institutions appear to be new. You remember that in Genesis, after creation, God blessed one Sabbath, okay? And that's the seventh day. 
After that, the book of Leviticus will go on and say there's also a Sabbath week, and then a Sabbath month, and a Sabbath year. And the seventh Sabbath year is the famous year of Jubilee. Okay? So the Sabbath institutions had, each of them had a focus. Okay? They were set up to protect this, to do this, and to do that. And most of them end up being the preservation of the social order and concern and protection for the poor. For example, in the case of the Jubilee year, the book of Deuteronomy, for example, attributes this meaning. You shall celebrate this so that there will be no poor one among you. So the celebration of the year of Jubilee clearly is to avoid the presence of poverty or poor ones among God's people. So the Jubilee year proclamation of favor also on the late Jesus' presentation of his ministry in the synagogue in Nazareth, as we read in the Gospel of Luke. And it became the banner under which Jesus carried out his mission. The ministry of Jesus inspired also the life of the early church and the early church's dedication to the word of God, fellowship or coming together, and serving the needy. Again, this is Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2 and chapter 4, as well as in their communities formed by Paul. Later, during the time of the early persecutions, members of the Christian communities were deeply involved in providing social services. Once the persecutions of Christians were over and ended, the church used its new freedom to influence society. And in the language of a church historian called Bill Meyer, he says that the spirit of Christian charity and devoted self-sacrifice, which had once so impressed the pagan world, was by no means dead. Rather, the needs of the times called forth new efforts in the service of Christian charity. History records innumerable examples of practical works of mercy. The church was a social power in the declining cultures of those days. The bishops were obliged to substitute for a corrupt and decrepit officialdom to assume the duties of public welfare servants to supply the needy and the suffering with food, clothing, and shelter, and in many instances, even to organize the defense of cities. The relief of the poor, the care of slaves and prisoners, and of travelers became the concern of bishops and the church. A part of the church's income was always set aside to aid the poor. And in large cities, such as Constantinople and in Antioch, the church's work among the poor was to a great extent highly organized. The, there arose, among, uh, arose also many institutions for the relief of every human need. Hospitals, poor houses, orphanages, fondling homes, shelters for travelers, and so on. And needless to say, some of the groups we know these days, as Knights of St. John and all, began as such hospitality institutions. Uh, they called them the hospitalers. Okay? And they provided security and responded to the need of pilgrims who wanted to visit the Holy Land in those years. So such responses to the conditions of, of the human person in the light of, the, of Christian faith and charity continued without, with, uh, with various actors and various protagonists, some lay, some religious orders, and yet some ecclesi ecclesial movements down through the ages. These various responses did feed and found formal expressions in the social teachings pronounced by the popes, beginning with Pobleo the 13th, in his famous encyclical, the first of his kind, called the Rerum Novarum, which was published in 1891. So it doesn't mean that before 1891, there was no social involvement in the world. It had been taking place. All the, the, the historical notes I gave were all instances of this. But they found an official presentation of formulation for the first time in the social encyclical of Pope Leo XIII in Rerum Novarum. 
In the context of the misery, this is the background of that encyclical. In the context of the misery of workers in the days of the Industrial Revolution and the emergence of economic systems, some of which extol the state over individual personal dignities, Rerum Novarum upheld the dignity of workers and the right to private property, to decent work, and to form unions to protect their interests. It conveyed the concern of the church not only about social development, but also, and most especially, about the misery and the plight of workers. Thus, establishing the church as an authoritative voice in dealing with issues surrounding social justice. 40 years after Pope Leo XIII, another encyclical, this time by Pope Pius XI, was written. These were the years of the Great Depression. Okay, almost every history book here in the United States talks about the 1930s as the great year of depression. So in that period, again, against this setting of a global depression, Pope, Leo the, uh, Pope Pius XI came out with another encyclical called, called the Quadragesimo Anno in 1931. So it just means 40 years after Rerum Novarum. And in this case, considering the economic conditions of the 1930s, especially those resulting from the Great Depression, the Holy Father expressed, stressed the principles of solidarity and cooperation in order to overcome the social contradictions of those days. The Pope also addressed the state's relationship with its citizens and presented the principle, the so-called very famous principle of subsidiarity. The term established the principle by which what the local level can do should not be taken over by the central government or central authority. Rather, the central authority should recognize what the local groups can do and grant them the space and the authority and power to do that. It's a principle that is very, very common and we apply almost every day of our lives. You take a household. There's a father, there's a mother, there's the children. What the father does, the mother doesn't do. And what the children do, the parents don't do. But the principle of subsidiarity will require the father to recognize the competence of the mother in doing certain things and make room for that. And the parents would have to recognize also the competence of children to do certain things and make room for that. Recognizing the different levels of competence of a performer, that is subsidiarity. You recognize that something that you can do, sure, can be better done by somebody at a lower level. You recognize that in fashion and make room for that person to do that. That is a famous principle of subsidiarity and is very basic in the church's social teaching. After that, in 1964, Pope John XXIII would come out with another encyclical called Pachem in Terrace, Peace on, uh, in, the, uh, in the World. And this would emphasize the importance of peace in the context of the dangerous Cold War, which had developed. This was the first encyclical directed not only to Catholics, but also to all men of goodwill. When you take up the paper documents, you'll find this. Before Pacham in Terrace, the popes would address the encyclical to Catholics and Christian people of the same faith. From this point on, from John the 23rd, the popes would address the encyclical, yes, to Christians and Catholics, but then and say, and all men of goodwill are going beyond uh, the Catholic faithful and the Catholic fold, addressing the rest of the people of the world. So, the encyclical would then, would, uh, would then dwell on the public authority of world community and, and the need to fashion some kind of a public authority to manage world events and tackle and solve problems of an economic, social, political, or cultural character which are posed by the universal common good. The call for some kind of public authority to take care of world, the world community comes up again, and it came up strongly in the last encyclical of Benedict XVI, where Benedict calls for some kind of world government to manage globalization. Globalization being a world event now goes beyond the power of any single nation. So Benedict XVI 
suggested probably the development, probably the UNB restructured to do that, but the, 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 the suitability of some world government to be able to deal with this global phenomenon. So this one shows that Benedict the Sisi was not the first to bring up the issue of some form of world authority to take care of events which supersede and go beyond the power of one single government or country. John the 23rd had already hinted at that in 1964 in the encyclical Pachem in Terrors. After that will come the Second Vatican Council, out of which we'll pull out the great encyclical, Gaudium et Spes, the church in the modern world, and that would also address uh, uh, the social conditions of man. And it would essentially represent the face of the church in deep solidarity with the human race and the modern world. Indeed, that, is, uh, that document will say the church, which has long experience in human affairs and has no desire to be involved in the political activities of any nation, seeks but one goal. And that goal is to carry forward the work of Christ under the lead of the befriending Holy Spirit. And that befriending Holy Spirit would exercise it in discernment, discerning the reading the signs of the time and finding and discerning the way to act and engage the world. Christ entered this world to give witness to the truth, to save and not to judge, to serve and not to be served. Another encyclical, and this same that came out in the same documents of Vatican II had to do with religious liberty, religious freedom. That encyclical will be named Dignitatis Humanae. That came out in the context of this same Second Vatican Council, and it will be the affirmation of the freedom. The UN Charter had come out with the eight list, huh? eight items of freedoms. This one will be specific. It's not just the freedom of conscience and the freedom of thought, but it's the freedom of religion. Freedom to exercise the religion as a freedom to seek the truth of God and the freedom for the practice and the witness of the faith people have. After this in 1967, this now will be the days of Pope Paul VI, would come out uh, uh, the uh, encyclical Popularum Progressio, the development of people, or as in England they would prefer to say the flourishing of people, because they find the word that they, 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 they argue that the word development doesn't translate very well, sviluppo. Eh? Uh, sviluppo is like when something blossoms, okay, opens out and blossom, and they think that development doesn't quite capture, so they say flourishing. Same sense of development. Uh, Provided you understand what we're talking about. So that's what Paul VI came out with first, and says development is the new name of peace. Without development, one cannot really talk about peace. And the world with inequality in development, therefore, means it's a recipe always of conflict and troubles. We cannot, have, well, uh, we cannot have peace when the issue of development is not taken care of. So he became also the spokesperson of the importance of sustainable economic and social development for all people through the recognition of the highest good, the acknowledgement of our relationship with God himself. After him, uh, still in his latter days, towards the end of his life, he will come out with the uh, 80 years after Rerum Novarum in 1971. He would, he would, uh, he would uh, 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 come out uh, with another encyclical called the you know, 80 years, huh? Octogesima Advenience. And there he will reflect on post-industrial society the changes and the problems that have occurred in industrialized Europe and industrial world, and the inadequacy of the ideologies of those days to respond to the challenges and the needs of human development. Finally, after Paul VI will come John Paul II, and under him would have three of these social encyclicals. He will first do devote an encyclical to labor and to work, and the rights of people to work and the fulfillment that people attain through work. That encyclical will be laborious excelsis, and the doing of work. Then he will come up also with a solicitudo re socialis, a concern for social order, and that will be more devoted to uh, emerging 
independent countries in Africa and the third world, and how they are grappling with the issue of development. And so that would be uh, uh, his concern in that. And finally, he will come up with another encyclical, cent uh, Centesimus Annus, or Centesimus Annus, uh, and that will be 100 years after Rerum Novarum. Okay, and that would also on underline the importance uh, of uh, understanding man's relationship with God, and the same problems of Rerum Novarum, the human dignity, the dignity of right, the right to private property and ownership. So of course, having gone through all of that, I do not claim to have exhausted all the social documents and all the social, you know, there's still a lot, okay, we did not come out in, uh, you know, in sacred cars. One, because when we talk about the social teaching of the church, it's not only when it comes out in encyclicals that we refer to them as social teachings. You probably know that almost every Wednesday, the Pope has an audience with the faithful. And he uses that medium also to teach. And some of what we refer to as social doctrine comes out in through, uh, through those teachings. Every Sunday from his window up in the Vatican, he also teaches. And what comes out can also be social teachings of the church. Over and above that, Organizations such as this, from institutes of uh, social doctrine, continue also to uh, foment okay, ideas that f go, uh, fl uh, flow into social doctrines of the church. So we've not by no any means provided you know, uh, an exhaustive list of, uh, of, uh, of uh, all the sources of social doctrine in the church. Otherwise, you would have to refer to others which touch on the human person by specific aspects like casti conubi, or encyclicals uh, like, like Evangelium Vitae of uh, Pope John Paul II, you know, about, about human life and how it's lived, and the famous you know, document Humane Vitae. Uh, all of this, one, one, one could mention in connection with this. So finally, in our own day, is Pope Benedict XVI, the present Pope. And although it's come out with three encyclicals, it's the last one which is referred to as a social encyclical, okay, Caritas in Veritate. The first encyclical, which is Deus Caritas Est, God is Love, also does have a few references to the presence of the human person in society and the uh, challenge or the, the need to, which is basically how social encyclicals, are, social doctrine is developed. All of us as Christians living in society feel called upon to encounter the social order of the world with our Christian faith and the love of God. And whenever we encounter the social order with our Christian faith and divine love, the result of it contributes to what we call the doctrine of the social teaching of the church. And so that has been an ongoing uh, type of thing. And in, 19, in, in, the, in the year 2009, Benedict came out with the Caritas in Caritate, originally meant to celebrate the 40th anniversary of uh, Populorum Progressio of the Pope and the 20th anniversary of Solicitudo Rei Socialis. It was written to commemorate these two encyclicals for their treatment of the issue of development. But as you know very well, before the encyclical got a chance to come out in 2009, the economic crisis broke loose on the world. And so the publication of this was withheld a little bit and reviewed with view to the present economic crisis so that the encyclical which came out ended up also addressing the present economic crisis which we have. But it came out in June 2009 uh, as, a, as a, the last uh, authoritative encyclical that uh, Pope Benedict XVI is given. And in it, it was to deal with the issue of human development in a globalized world. Paul VI had done it, John Paul II had done it, but the situation they dealt with has now become a global phenomenon a globalized world, and that's what they came to deal with. So I would wish and invite you to notice that over the years, the social order to which the church's social teaching refers has continuously been evolving from the misery of workers in the days of Pobleo the 13th to the economic crisis or the Great Recession of the 1930s, which was the day that the, the setting for the encyclical of Pope Pius XI, to decolonization and the emergence of third worldism, uh, which underlay the teaching of Pope John XXIII and Paul VI, to the fall of Berlin, the fall of the wall of Berlin, not Berlin, the fall of the wall of Berlin, 
and the political changes in Eastern Europe, which was the setting for the encyclicals of Pope John Paul II. Okay, to the present situation of a globalized, you know, globalization, on the development, financial, economic crisis, ecological crisis, moral, and even anthropological crisis of the days of Benedict the Sixteenth. So, in all of these encyclicals and messages, the insights of scriptures, theology, philosophy, economics, ecology, and politics have been harnessed coherently to formulate a social teaching that places the human person, his total and integral development, at the center of world systems of thought and activity. And it is important to know that. We'll come back to this towards the end. In all the encyclicals, what you have is that the insight of scriptures, theology, philosophy, social sciences, economics, ecology, and politics are harnessed to formulate coherently a social teaching that seeks to establish the human person at the center of world thinking and world development. So the centrality of the human person in the world system of thought is a victim of the church's social teaching. And indeed, Pope Benedict the system will teach later that when, this, when the human person is displaced from the center of all of these things, we have crisis. One may then refer to the present economic crisis as a replacement of gain and profit instead of the human person, the center of the economic system. And that leads to the crisis that we have. So within the heritage then, within this heritage, Caritas and Veritate treats the conditions under which the human person develops integrally in all its dimensions and forms under the challenging conditions of our contemporary and globalized world. Pope Benedict XVI constantly refers to Second Vatican Council, Gaudium et Spes, Populorum Progresso, Solicitude Re Sociale, and the basic principles which are enunciated in all of these, namely human dignity, common good, the universal destination of the goods of the earth, brotherhood of the human family, solidarity, and subsidiarity. If we talk, talk about any principles of the social doctrine of the church, it is this. The dignity of the human person, the common good, the universal destination of the goods of the earth, brotherhood of the human family, its unity, solidarity, and subsidiarity. These are the basic principles underlying all the social doctrine or the social teachings of the church. And they will constantly be referred to in all the documents that the church magisterium or hierarchically comes up with. So Benedict would appeal to all of these to basically make three affirmations. To underline also the centrality of the human person, his well-being and total development in all activities of the human person. Two, to remind the human person of his vocation to gift and transcendence, and so to evangelize to evangelize our world of inequalities and poverty with the logic of gift and gratuitousness. This is a novelty that comes after this encyclical, Caritas and Veritate, which has challenged a lot of entrepreneurs and bankers about what does the logic of gift and gratuitous mean in the world. But Benedict XVI talks about it by saying that the only logic according to which God has acted in this world is his love. Nothing else has moved God to do anything in this world. And the invitation then is to human being created in the image and likeness of God to imitate the love of God. That becomes the basic of the logic of gift and gratuitousness. Okay, so for us to imitate that. And finally, to teach that man's activity with which he or she builds the earthly city is an anticipation of the universal city of God when this activity is inspired by the love of God and by justice to seek the well-being of the human person whole and entire. So these are the three basic affirmations of Benedict XVI in his encyclical. If I may repeat them, the centrality of the human person in every activity of man. Two, to remind the human person of his vocation to gift and to transcendence. 
and to try to evangelize our world of inequalities and poverty with the logic of gift and the logic of gratuitousness. And finally, thirdly, to teach that man's activity with which he builds this earthly city is an anticipation of the heavenly city when this activity is inspired by the love of God and by justice to seek the well-being of the human person whole and entire. So this has been an attempt to, I don't know in how many seconds or minutes, to present the social doctrine of the church. Very long tradition, began but not yet finished, still ongoing, but that's to a, you know, very, uh, that then if you're able to retain about the church's social doctrine, the basic six principles, human dignity, the common good, principle of common good, the universal destination of the goods of the earth, solidarity, subsidiarity, and the brotherhood, uh, the common human family having one origin, therefore, all being together. If you're able to retain these six principles, you're okay with the church social doctrine. You can all graduate tomorrow. <laughs> okay, we'll get your degrees. And then with all of this, the formulation of this in the last or the latest encyclical seeks to affirm three things. The centrality of the human person in every activity and system of thought of man. The invitation of man to imitate God, responding to his transcendence to apply the logic of gift and gratuitousness in our world of inequalities and poverty. And then tell you to remember that with our activity in this world, whatever it is, we're building an earthly city. And that earthly city is meant to participate or to anticipate the heavenly city of God when our activities are guided by the same divine principle of love and justice. So as Christians, that's our vocation. We suppose on earth to build an earthly city which anticipates the heavenly city, provided we inspire all what we do with divine love, justice, to build a situation which promotes the well-being of the human person. So that much, it does this much about the social doctrine of the church. Now with all of this, as we just heard me say, the, human, the development of the human person whole and entire is the big objective. It's what is supposed to be achieved. But the persistence of poverty, global poverty, which is part of the theme of, uh, of this session, is a denial of the actualization of this vision that Pope uh, Benedict XVI has uh, expressed. There's this building of earthly city which anticipates the heavenly city. So the persistence of poverty in the world, global poverty, is the denial of the actualization of this vision of the encyclical Caritas and Veritate. And it is perhaps the greatest challenge then to the mission of the church itself. Poverty in our world has been variously characterized as an affront to civilization and sometimes even as a scandal. And you yourselves, I mean, at this seminar, have variously analyzed and diagnosed the phenomenon of global poverty. But as you know, at the beginning of the millennium, 2000, this scandal so provoked the conscience of the United Nations that it formulated the famous Millennium Development Goals, huh? those eight objectives. When the UN then, when it met last September, however, to evaluate the conduct of the Millennium Development Program and their chances of success, it acknowledged that some success has been achieved, although there's still a lot to go, although there was a certain amount of hysteria, whether the things can be achieved in the five years that we still got to go. The Millennium Development Goals were for 15 years, okay, 10 years of, uh, just run by quickly, we now have five. And the thing was, everybody rushed, can we, can we you know, gather the money to be able to achieve this? But it became also abundantly clear, at least to me, and the delegation of the Holy See to that discussion, that our world is not only dealing with the eradication of poverty of poor countries, which is essentially poverty of deprivation and its dehumanizing effects. In other words, our world is not simply dealing with material poverty. It became clear also that there is another type of poverty at work, 
a spiritual poverty, a poverty of mind and spirit, a poverty of values, a poverty of consistency to commitment, sincerity, and goodwill, which is closely related to the persistence of material poverty. So it readily disposes the world, this type of poverty, the spiritual poverty, it readily disposes the world to solve material poverty by recourse sometimes to anti-life measures, eliminating the poor rather than investing in and developing the resourcefulness of the poor, making them the protagonists of their own emergence out of poverty, having them know more, have more in order to be more, as Benedict XVI would affirm, and us, the two economists from Pakistan and India, uh, Mahboud ur Haq and Amartya Sen would say, by calling for an enhanced standard of living through exposure and access to education and to health care. So my dear friends, more than 60 years ago, the Charter of the United Nations spoke about promoting social progress and better standards of living in larger freedom, about tolerance and living together in peace and with one another as good neighbors, about higher standards of living, full employment, and social advancement. In that context, the term development was perceived as, was perceived as and equated with the growing gross domestic product, GDP, huh? namely that, that dollar value of goods produced and services provided each year. So according to this, when the GDP is divided by the population of a country, you're able to tell how well developed a country is or how poorly, uh, you know, how badly developed a country is. So if it is higher than that of last year, then the country is said to be developing. And if it is lower or higher than the GDP of a neighboring country, then a country is supposed to be better or better developed than a neighboring country. But over the past 20 years, there's been a lot of thinking about this. And this narrowly economic vision of development has undergone some changes. First change was the addition of the adjective human. So that the talk is no more development, but human development. And so in the report of the UNDP, uh, United Nations Development in our program, in that report of 2010, 20, uh, 2010, the title is the real wealth of the nations, pathways to human development. Marking this uh, anniversary, the UNDP then report reaffirms the centrality of the human person in every process of development. So it's now more the church and encyclicals which are talking about human development. Now the UNDP is also beginning to talk about human development. The report presents a general a positive picture and affirms that progress in health and education can lead to successes in its human development program. And so, relying on the works of the economists, one of whom I'm sure lives here in the United States and teaches someplace in Harvard, Mahboud Urhaq of Pakistan and Amartya Zen of India, the report discusses the indicators of human development according to which development cannot be understood merely in terms of increase in GDP, but must take into consideration other factors, including the quality of life and the people's access to health and to education. So the Human Development Index is the result of three components. People's standard of living, access to health and access to education. And these, uh, this is considered now to be far more helpful than a simple economic uh, development factor because this includes not only economic factors and conditions but also social factors and social conditions. And it's supposed to be a response to material poverty. But material poverty is not the only obstacle to human development. Spiritual poverty stymies human development even more badly. Spiritual poverty is worse than material poverty. The human person, as you know, 
the protagonist of development, has a vocation not only to development, but also to transcendence in correspondence to his creation, uh, uh, to his being as body and soul, called to communion with God. Accordingly, to ignore the spiritual dimension, to overlook the transcendent aspects of the human person in efforts at overcoming poverty actually diminishes human development. But regrettably, this narrowing has been an increasing trend since the Second World War, especially in the so-called First World, but a trend which is fast also coming to the developing world. But there cannot be a holistic development and a universal common good unless people's spiritual and moral welfare are taken into account, considered in their totality as body and soul. So it means to leave religion out of their social picture, claiming that it belongs exclusively to the private sphere, or opposing its inclusion in public life as divisive or even irrational, is to deny full religious liberty, which is not only a basic human right, but in some sense, the fundamental one on which all other rights depend. So talking about people's spiritual and moral welfare, I recall, for example, in 2009, at the celebration of the African, Second African Synod in Rome, at the opening mass, most of us out there were surprised by the language that the Pope Benedict XVI used in his homily. In the opening, in the, in the, in the, in the homily at the opening mass, the Pope exhorted and warned African countries to be careful about two dangerous pathologies, stalking her path. These he went on to specify as religious fundamentalism combined with political and economic interest. And the second pathology was practical materialism combined with relativ relativist and nihilistic thought. Then the Pope went on to say, in language which I, for, you know, individual personally found very tough, Pope went on to say that the latter, that a practical materialism combined with relativist and nihilistic thought, the Pope referred to that as sickness of the spirit. And he says it's a sickness of the West which is being transported to a lot of development countries as spiritual toxic waste. Tough language, yeah? Spiritual sickness, which is being transported to the development world as spiritual toxic waste. And he says that this, however, is anthropological. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sickness or disease that is with man himself, which affects his vision of reality and the development of the human person. And he goes on to say, when the, when the vision of the human person is affected or diminished in any way by any of these ideologies, then the vision of the development of the human person itself is also affected. So the crisis derived from ideologies which diminish man's vision of the truth. So instead of proposing his true vocation to authentic and true love, to being a gift to unity, brotherhood, solidarity, and to transcendence, the ideologies reduce and limit this vision. So here briefly are manifestations of what the Pope had referred to as sickness of the spirit. This anthropological problem afflicting our society in the light of which we say that it in a way affects material poverty and in a way even sustains material poverty. And so if we trying or looking for ways of dealing with material poverty, we cannot leave out of consideration this spiritual poverty to the extent that it affects the whole vision and the conception of the development of the human person. The first manifestation of this sickness of the spirit or this, uh, you know, what the Pope refers to as uh, uh, spiritual poverty is the sense 
of the human person. It is a sense of the emerging sense of the human person about its self-sufficiency. Man is only the product, so this vision says, man is only the product of human culture, and he evolves and fashions himself or herself independently of human nature and any universal laws and norms. Thus, man is the author of himself, of his, her life, of his or her life, and of his society or her society. And not only does he, so not only does man or the human person replace God, but he or she, so the human person, does away with God completely. So the first manifestation of this spiritual sickness, according to the Holy Father, is increasingly a world that, is, that makes very, very little room for God. Okay? It's as it were the death of God, okay? a theology which is a thought which is afflicted for a while. The second manifestation is actually, it's actually a consequence of the first one. And it is that the human person thinks that it owes nothing to anyone except to himself or herself. Thus, disconnected from the common good and objective moral law, the human person now seeks in majority opinion, however unstable this may be, the basis for the determination of morality. It means that we deal in these days more and more with a phenomenon where, by consensus and majority position, a legislation is judged to be moral or not. Something becomes moral because it is decided upon by the majority and by consensus, not by reference to any objective moral standard. The fourth manifestation is a techno technocratic ideology which idealizes technical progress and entrusts the entire process of development to technology alone. Again, this also produces a sense or a sensation of man's self-sufficiency, autonomy, and a certain amount of you know, a misguided sense of freedom. And then finally, or a fifth manifestation cannot be the final one. We can do it all. A, a fifth manifestation is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an utopia of a return to humanity's origins and beginning. This utopia, or this ideology, aims at deconstructing concepts about human person and its institutions. Deconstruct huh? ideas about a human person and its institutions, about what a man is, about what a woman is, about what a family is, about what marriage is, and about what children is. So that they, with the, the, the objective is that uh, humanity will return to a stage where it will no more be guided by certain cultural molds or some ideas or cultural habits transmitted from the past, but all will be the same and all will be equal. Okay, this is the, what is referred to as the utopia of a return to humanity's original form. So while each of these ideologies can be rebutted with historical or even philosophical argument, such a debate rarely wins the day. It may be more effective to consider a deeper form of poverty, namely the poverty of isolation. And this is how Pope Benedict formulates this poverty of isolation. If we look closely at other kinds of poverty, including material forms, we see that they are born from isolation, from not being loved or from difficulties in being able to love. Poverty is often produced by a rejection of God's love, by man's basic and tragic tendency to close in on himself or herself, thinking himself or herself to be self-sufficient or merely an insignificant and ephemeral fact or a stranger in a random universe. The human person then is alienated when he or she is alone, when he or she is detached from reality and when he or she stops thinking and believing in a foundation. All of humanity is alienated when too much trust is placed in merely human projects and ideologies and false utopia uh, without any regard to man's transcendent vocation. So instead, for us as a church, 
With our rich patrimony of values and principles, the church and her Christian members of faithful are invited to resist the toxic ideologies and help others to become aware of their true identity and dignity as sons and daughters of God, establishing democratic institutions and recognizing human rights and their corresponding duties. And the various social ministries of the church are responses to this challenge and to this invitation. What are these social ministries? Be very brief, try to be very brief over here. As we had a chance to share the thoughts ideas about this once, uh, talking to the social ministries group in Washington, D.C., uh, some, some in, the, in the month of February, a true understanding of church ministry starts with the faith experience of the ecclesial community. Responding to God's revelation of his love and truth in Jesus, people are transformed by the power of God's word and re-socialized by his love in the Holy Spirit. This new social reality, the ecclesial community, proclaims the love and the truth of God's love, which surrounds it. And from this experience, people become essentially two things. They become subjects of love and of truth, and thus become agents of a new freedom and a new way of thinking, instruments of grace and communion, spreading the good news of love. And two, they become builders of an earthly city, we saw this before, which anticipates the heavenly city because it's inspired by God's love and justice. So for us Christians, inspired by God's love, we become agents of a new freedom. That helps the human person identify his real identity before God. Secondly, we become builders of an earthly city with our social services, which anticipates the heavenly city of God. And we'll try to capture this in just five elements, and with that bring this intervention to a close. The Holy Father, Benedict, expressing this once said, the complexity and the gravity of the present economic situation rightly causes us concern, but we must adopt a realistic attitude as we take up with confidence and hope the new responsibilities to which we are called by the prospect of a world in need of profound cultural renewal, a world that needs to rediscover fundamental values on which to build a better future. The current crisis obliges all of us to replan our journey, to set ourselves new rules, and to discover new forms of commitment, to build on positive experiences, and to reject negative experiences. The crisis thus becomes an opportunity for discernment in which to shape a new vision for the future in this spirit with confidence rather than with resignation, it is appropriate to address the difficulties of our present time. So, what are these elements? What is the Pope talking about? The Pope identifies five elements with which we can redirect our social ministry with view to creating on earth a city which anticipates the heavenly city of God. And I'll briefly go through these five elements the Pope talks about. One, he says, Begin with a realistic attitude, approaching the difficulties of the present times with discernment. Two, ground the work in fundamental values, a new vision for the future. Three, with confidence rather than with resignation, take up the new responsibilities and trust them to us. Four, be open to profound cultural renewal with confidence and with hope. And fifthly, commit to new rules, new forms of commitment with coherence and consistency. Let's take each of these briefly. The first step is surely to face the difficulties of the present time, not with ready-made answers or simplistic ideologies, but with a realistic attitude and with discernment. This is the church's duty, this is the church's duty 
to scrutinize the signs of the times and to interpret them in the light of the gospel. The last speaker uh, talked about seeing, uh, seeing, and, you know, see, see, seeing well. So in order to confront the problems of our world, we must first study them. We must learn to see and see them clearly and recognize what constitutes injustice at every level. And I may add, seeing demands some more than a glance. Seeing is not the same as a glance. A glance is a quick overview. Seeing is more thorough. Rather, in seeing, using the available scientific tools, we must conduct a rigorous analysis of the social conditions, their causes, their interconnectedness, their effects especially on the poor and the marginalized, and the contemporary experience of people of God who struggle. Besides an empirical analysis, we must make use of biblical insight, which sometimes entails a solitary research, but which often is a collaborative task. Out of all of this emerges a way forward and proposals which of what to do and what not to do. The second, competence. Our next step is to ground the work in fundamental values, a new vision for the future, which can only begin with ourselves. And so, this second competence can rightly be called an experience of conversion. To know and to accept our oneself is the beginning of wisdom. And this attitude must be accompanied by a willingness to change, to work on oneself. I'll explain. We just saw some manifestations of the sickness of the spirit. And the Holy Father explains clearly the spiritual roots of the new vision we require. When the human person is far away from God, he is unsettled and he's ill at ease. Because reason by itself is capable of grasping the equality between people and of giving stability to the civic coexistence that exists. But reason alone cannot make us brothers. Let me explain. It has been said often that globalization has brought us all together. That is true. Globalization has shortened and eliminated, eliminated distances and separation between us. But being brought together is not the same as being transformed into a sense of fraternity. We may be brought together, one living close to the other, but the question is, does that make us brothers and sisters? And we say that transformation goes beyond the work of reason. It requires faith and a religious experience. So, true fraternity only originates in a transcendent vocation from God, the Father who loved us first, and teaches us through the Son what fraternal charity is all about. So the outer ecology of the structures of our human family, our human community, and our society, what we call justice and peace, or their absence, reflects an inner ecology of each individual, of each community, and of each organization. Individuals who refuse to change will continue with the establishment and maintenance of unjust and conflictive societies. Those who promote peaceful transformation of the world in a convincing way have usually worked to transform oppressive and violent tendencies within themselves, and thus have become credible advocates for those who are suffering the violent consequences of unjust structures. The real big disciples and apostles of transformation and change and peace in the world are people who have made this experience deep down within themselves. Third, competency. The Holy Father suggests that with confidence rather than with resignation, let us take up the new responsibilities which go with a new vocation and mission. For a Christian, the starting point and the goal of all building is Christ the Alpha and the Omega. So our vision is entirely shaped by God, by his plan of salvation for the world. And at its center, at the center of this plan, is the human person. So the industrial and the scientific re revolution 
have irreversibly changed Western humanity's picture of the world and man's place in it. The earth got reduced to a collection of material objects, structured like a machine and treated as such, rather than recognizing the intrinsic worth of every human creature and every person and the sense of the common good. But the more we strive to secure a common good corresponding to the real needs of our neighbors, the more effectively we love them. Every Christian is called to practice this charity in a manner corresponding to his vocation and according to the degree of influence he wields in society. The fourth competence, the fourth how, the Holy Father will have us be open to profound cultural renewal and show confidence and hope. Quite counterculturally, we Christians firmly believe that a, most, a, most just, a more just society and peaceful one is still possible in the world. And this competence invites us not to be, not to yield to resignation. For if we resign ourselves to fatalism, this can have drastic consequences for our overall well-being and that of others. On the contrary, and despite the naysayers, economic resources do exist in our world today still. That can help wipe the tears from the eyes of those who suffer injustice, who lack the basics of dignified life, and who are in danger from any deterioration in the climate. And the poor do benefit from champions of solidarity who believe that injustice can be reduced, that harmonious relationship can still be fostered, and that our planetary ecology can still be made sustainable and that a world of greater communion is still possible. Finally, gathering the wisdom of all the competencies we've talked about, we come now to commit ourselves to new rules and new forms of engagement with coherence and with consistency. Appreciating God's plan and our place in it is what gives rise to the duty of believers to unite their efforts with those of all men and all women, all of goodwill, with followers of other religions and even with non-believers, so that this world of ours may effectively correspond to the divine plan, living as a family on the God's of the Creator's watchful eye. So this fifth competence for building a society of greater peace and justice is cooperation collaboration, networking, and solidarity. All that binds people together is the multiple efforts required. This means that groups, organizations, institutions, movements of different persuasions, whether Catholic, Christian, or interreligious, or even non-confessional, need to respect one another's identities and differences, and not to see one another as competitors, competing with one another. We must cooperate, we must coordinate, and make our efforts converge towards the very same goals, namely greater justice, greater security, greater transparency, and so greater peace. The church is an expert in humanity, and it has often been affirmed, and the church's expertise is rooted in its active engagement in human affairs. And so, by way of concluding, in the year 2010, that is this year, in the World Day of Peace message, the Holy Father said that today, in an increasingly globalized world, Christians are called not only through their responsible involvement in civic, economic, and political life, but also through the witness of their charity and faith to offer a valuable contribution to the laborious and stimulating pursuit of justice integral human development, and the right ordering of human affairs. This baptismal experience of life of the ecclesial community does not close in on itself, but interacts at every level with the world. And it is in living in Jesus, the supreme truth and the good, that the faithful discover a new and appropriate order of good and an authentic scale of values to live by and to witness to to minister 
and to serve. So it is our prayer that God, who has truly begun the ministry of human flourishing within the different within the different uh, so, uh, service groups, and especially the deepening of such flourishing in centers of learning like this, may bring it all to greater faithfulness and fulfillment and teach and help us all, coordinating our efforts and the result of our researches to be able to contribute to the wiping of poverty in our world. Thank you for your kind attention. as remarkable an afternoon for you as it was 